This is the first lecture of University College Cork Mathematics MA 1012 Engineering Mathematics uh, Mathematical Methods 2. In this lecture we'll look at uh, complex numbers and complex functions of a complex variable. Let's recall uh, some basic facts about polynomial functions. So a simple example, um, we look at an equation like x squared plus 3x plus 2 equals 0. Um, so uh, we're dealing with ordinary real numbers for the moment here. Um, so with the, um, this polynomial, of course, factors, uh, you can factor as x plus 1 times x plus 2. And um, so you can find the roots from this one you get, from this factor you get x equals minus 1 as a root, and from this factor you get x equals minus 2 as a root. Um, so it's a quadratic equation, it is, in other words, degree 2 as an equation, the highest power of x is 2. It's a polynomial equation because it's the sum of terms, all the terms being um, a constant times a power of the variable. And uh, the highest power is 2, so it's a quadratic polynomial. And so it has, at most, two roots. And in this case, it has exactly two roots. But sometimes you have uh, worse examples. Uh, some examples don't seem to have any roots. Um, if we look at a simple example like x squared plus 1 equals 0, and that's going to be our main example of a polynomial that doesn't seem to want to have any roots. Um, why doesn't it have roots? Um, why doesn't it have no no real number roots? Uh, no real, we'll say, number roots. So real number meaning an ordinary number in the sense of mathematics. Um, so positive, negative, zero. Uh, it could be a decimal or a fraction. It doesn't have any such thing. Why doesn't it? Because uh, remember that minus signs cancel in pairs when you multiply a negative number times another negative number. The minus signs cancel in pairs. So if I take a number and multiply it by itself, x times x is x squared. The minus signs, the can they'll cancel in pairs. So if there's a minus sign in one of them, there's a two minus signs. They'll cancel each other out. And if there's no minus sign in one, there's no minus sign in the other. So there's nothing to cancel out. And so whatever we do, that can't be negative. It's not negative. So, um, so it means then, if I add something positive to it, x squared plus anything positive, like 1, that's definitely positive, no matter what x is. Any real number, x, well, real number. Ordinary number in the usual sense of numbers. So it doesn't work out to be 0. It's positive, so it's not 0. So it's not possible to have a real number that satisfies this thing. So in the Renaissance, um, Cardano was led to the idea that he might try to invent a formal solution to this equation. We invent, um, invent a, an abstract uh, a sort of pretend solution. We just write down a symbol, uh, which uh, in, this, in these lectures will be called I. Um, and uh, we require that every time we multiply an i by itself, we get to cut that out and replace it with a minus 1. So we get to manipulate i as if it was just an abstract variable. But every time we hit two i's multiplied together, we chop that out and place in a minus 1 instead. And that's a game we can play. Um, but of course, it's not an ordinary real number because this equation uh, here, which is the property that we're going to use to define this symbol i, you're allowed to do ordinary arithmetic on it, but every time you hit a, an i times an i, you replace it by minus 1. That is exactly the same by adding uh, the 1 to both sides of saying i squared plus 1 is 0. And that's exactly the equation we wanted to solve that doesn't have any solutions. There's no way to put an x in here that'll satisfy this. So in particular, there's no way to put any, like we call x, i. Instead, there's no way to put an i in there to satisfy it. But we'll still pretend there is one. If we just pretend that there is such a thing, then it turns out to be very practical, and very useful, uh, a useful game we could play. So once we allow that uh, abstract symbol i into the game, even if there isn't really such a thing in the world, um, that doesn't really matter because we can always just pretend there is, and uh, and then we can we can start playing with with what we call complex numbers. A complex number is um, any expression uh, of the form uh, complex number equals x plus i y. Uh, 
where x and y are ordinary real numbers. And uh, the uh, x is called the real part of z, and y is called the imaginary part of z. We should uh, maybe just to stress uh, here that note, note that both x and y are ordinary real numbers. So in particular, the imaginary part of the number is not i times y, but y itself. It's the real number y that's called the imaginary part. And we'll use the notation imaginary part of z as y and real part or e part of z as x for the real and imaginary parts. Um, it's traditional to use the notation that the um, the real numbers are the set of all real numbers is written as R with a double back on it. R is the set of real numbers, x such that x is a real number. That's the set of all real numbers. And C is the set of all complex numbers, the set of numbers z equals x plus i y, so x and y are real. So it's the set of all complex numbers. Again, it's a C, but with a slash through it, and this is an R with a double back on it, the traditional notation. Um, I should point out that um, I'm following the, the lecture notes, which are Stephen Will's notes. Um, Uh, and in his notes, he always uses i for the symbol that i squared is, has i squared equals minus 1, this abstract symbol we've invented. But in engineering texts, it's, uh, it's also often done as j. So you may find that in engineering, uh, it's most often uh, j uh, with j squared is minus 1. And either notation is fine, whichever you prefer is fine with me. I'll probably be pretty clear about whether you what you mean when you start you writing J's instead of I's or vice versa. So um, since we have uh, our complex numbers written as uh, Z is X plus I Y, it, we know immediately that they're equal, that two complex numbers are equal just in their real imaginary parts are equal. Um, so we know what equals means. And um, we'll also have to figure out how to manipulate them uh, algebraically using other uh, arithmetic rules. Um, first of all, the most obvious rule is that every real number, uh, x in the real numbers, uh, is thought of as uh, as being uh, x plus no imaginary part in the complex numbers. So in that way, we can say that the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. Every real number is a complex number, but with a zero imaginary part. And that way we identify all the real numbers as sitting inside the complex numbers in the obvious way. Now if we want to carry out arithmetic on, uh, on complex numbers, we can do that uh, by obvious definitions. If we have uh, complex numbers, z is x plus i y, and w is u plus i v, both of those are, are fairly standard notations in the subject, then um, we'll define addition by saying the sum of those two complex numbers is defined to be, sometimes write colon equals to mean is defined to be, um, add their real parts, and then i times add their imaginary parts. So um, the obvious definition, and the obvious definition of subtraction is that we'd subtract the real parts, and we'd also subtract the imaginary parts. So it's very easy to do. The multiplication is 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 the also the obvious thing. If you were just to multiply them out um, by pretending that you knew what multiplication meant, you'd come up with the right definition. If we just formally write down uh, the z expanded its real imaginary parts and the w expanded sorry w expanded its real imaginary parts, uh, that should be u, not w. Okay, u plus i v. If we just formally expand that out, x times u. Uh, plus i times this, plus i times that, plus that. So let's expand that out, plus x times i times v, plus i times y times u, plus i times y times i times v. If you just expand it all out, you get this. We can collect up all the terms with that have i's in them. That's these two terms here. But also we have two i's in here. Um, so 
let's write it this way. Let's put all the i's at the end, um, the expression. Um, so it'll be xv times i plus yu times i. That'll put all the i's at the end. In this case, I want to put the i's at the end together. yvi times i. And i times i is i squared, which is minus 1. So that'd be xu plus can factor all the, the i's together, xv plus yui, and then i squared is minus 1, so that'll be minus yv. These uh, two i's together became a single minus sign. So, um, so we now have uh, a simple expression we can put. This is now real. It has no i's in it anymore, so it's real. And so it's xu minus yv plus uh, x, v, plus y, u, times i. So that'll be the definition. So that's, uh, now, if we, that if we pretended we knew what multiplication meant, uh, we would expand it out and come up with this answer. And now we can say, let's just make that be the answer. That'll be the definition of multiplication. Because after all, we hadn't defined what it is to multiply complex numbers. We pretended we knew and expanded it out. But now we'll just use that as a definition. So that enables us to multiply complex numbers. So let's see if we can do some examples of arithmetic with complex numbers. Um, we can do simple examples. If z is 1 plus 2i, and if w is uh, 3 minus 5i, then z plus w is 1 plus 2i plus 3 minus 5i, and then that just becomes, uh, add the real parts, 1 plus 3, and then add the imaginary parts, 2 minus 5, i. 1 plus 3 is 4, 2 minus 5 is minus 3. Um, so similarly, you can work out, so uh, there's space for you in the, in the lecture notes to work out for yourself what you think should be z minus w and z times w. Uh, it, division is a bit more complicated, which is why we haven't done it yet. Um, if we want to divide complex numbers, it helps to first be able to do uh, what we call conjugation of complex numbers. It's a very simple thing to do. It's harder to, to, to explain than it is to, to actually carry out. Um, if we have z is x plus um, i y or y i, um, then we uh, define z bar with a bar on top is defined simply to mean that we change the sign on the y part and keep the x part the same. So if we took z is 1 plus 2i, then z bar would be 1 minus 2i. It's that simple. You just change the sign on the imaginary part. So nothing very sophisticated. Um, but the reason for introducing it is that uh, there's a rather uh, striking identity here, which we get if we multiply any z is x plus i plus i y. If we multiply that z by z bar, uh, we get x plus i y times x minus i y, which multiply together to give us, if you multiply the, the real parts, to give us an x squared. And we remember how our multiplication works with the imaginary, matter times the imaginary, i times minus i. Well, let's expand it all out just to be careful. So we can do this one, so minus x y i. And then this one here is uh, plus x y i x y i so that's the uh, minus x y i plus x y i and then the last one is a bit more complicated it's the very last term is i y times minus i y so let's expand all that out and see what we get um, so it's um, equal to uh, this one is just x squared these two knock each other out because they're exactly equal with the opposite sign. So they knock each other out, and we're just left with this term, which is a bit more complicated. It's got two y's in it, so there's no doubt about having a y squared coming out the front, times i times minus i. And we simply have to note that i times i is minus 1, and then minus signs cancel in pairs. So we've got i times i is one, a single minus sign, and then another minus sign sitting there. The two minus signs knock each other out you get y squared. So in other words, a minus here, and then i times i is another minus, 
giving me two minuses multiplied by each other, giving me one. Okay, so it's x squared plus y squared. And this is an important observation because we'll remember from the Pythagorean theorem that um, the square root of x squared plus y squared is the length. If we had a triangle with sides x and y, then the length of this thing would be the square root of x squared plus y squared. And so what we're finding is somehow a relationship between complex numbers and Pythagorean theorem. Um, uh, also because this, it's also important because this sort of quantity comes up a lot in manipulating complex numbers. In particular, um, an observation about that particular complex number um, that's more or less uh, immediate is that um, if you look at um, this z, z bar, we said it was x squared plus y squared. And uh, in particular, either looking at the Pythagorean theorem picture or just looking at the arithmetic of it, you can convince yourself that if um, x is not 0, then of course x squared is positive. If y is not 0, then y squared is positive. So x squared plus plus y squared is positive unless both are 0. And so therefore, uh, turning that into complex numbers, this quantity is positive unless both the x and the y are zero. So we get z z bar is positive. It's a positive real number. Even though it's made out of complex number pieces, z and z bar individually, we put the two together in exactly this combination. It doesn't give us a complex number because it's a real number. That's always a real number. So even though there's a complex number of pieces put together, when you multiply them in exactly that combination, z times z bar, you always get a real number. And this guy is positive unless both the x and the y are both zero, which is exactly the complex number z being the zero complex number. That is to say, where zero is a complex number means zero real part and zero imaginary part. Um, so that means that uh, z, z bar is positive unless z is zero. Okay, so now we're going to use that in, de in, in trying, trying to construct a notion of division. Just as we did before, we said that we'd like to um, formally pretend we know what we're doing, manipulate the symbols, and then in the end we'll come up with the right answer, just like we did for multiplication. Um, if we wanted to divide complex numbers by each other, we pretended we knew what that meant, so we haven't really defined what we mean by dividing complex numbers by each other, but if we pretend we know what, what we mean, then we usually come up with the right answer in mathematics. Um, if we muck around as if we knew what we were doing, uh, sometimes we'll just hit on the right answer. So we'll put this in as z uh, over w, but multiply, much like we did with um, when we worked with square roots, uh, we multiplied by conjugate radicals. We can think of it that i is the square root of minus 1, so we want to make conjugate radicals, which is exactly mean conjugate complex numbers. So I'm going to simply multiply the denominator by w bar. I have a w here. I have z and w, and I want to define divine division. I want to make sense out of what it means to divide a complex number by another one. If I pretend I knew what it, I meant, I would multiply by w bar uh, in the numerator and denominator because that will give me a 1. Right? w bar divided by w bar is 1. Anything divided by itself is 1. So that's not scary. That's just introducing a factor of 1, which won't change the answer. But it has the advantage that it's going to make the w and the w bar knock each other out and give me a real number which is add what we've seen before. So that's z w bar divided by w w bar. And that is somewhat simpler because that's a real number. And we also know it's a non-zero real number unless w is zero. So of course we can't divide by zero just like we couldn't divide by zero with any other kind of numbers. But if we have any non-zero number w, we can use this to divide by it because it simply says that you have to multiply these two complex numbers and then you have to scale the result by 1 over the this this real number. So let's expand that out further and see what it gives us just to make sure we have a, a clear idea of what we mean. What does it look like when you actually do it? So if we had x plus i y as z and u plus i v as w, it would be u minus i v as w bar. So there's z w bar. And then we know w, w bar, we worked out, is just the sum of squares of the entries. So that would be just u squared plus v squared. Going back to our previous result that if you take a complex number z is x plus i, y, we said that z, z bar was the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts. So the, the same reasoning, um, w, w bar is the sum of the squares of the, of the parts, the real and imaginary parts of w. So that'll be... Uh, this guy here, and then that's fairly easy to do. We can expand this out as x 
u. Um, we said that would turn out to be, now let's see, that's an i times a minus i, uh, so which is a 1, so it's plus yv. And then there are imaginary parts to gather up. There's an imaginary part here, an imaginary part here, so we put them together and we get yu minus xvi, and then all divided by u squared plus v squared. And finally, so again, we're just pretending we know what division means. We're manipulating it as if we did. And finally, what we have in the final answer is xu plus yv divided by u squared plus v squared, because that's these numbers divided by these numbers. And then there's the imaginary part here, these numbers divided by these numbers, so yu minus xv divided by u squared plus v squared i. Now that's too difficult to remember. I, I wouldn't want to try and remember this. Um, it's too hard. Uh, but it does give us a definition of division. We could say that we'll define z divided by w to be this thing. But of course no one will really remember how to do that. What I do remember is the simple trick. I only remember, I don't remember all this. That's too complicated. No one's going to remember that. All you remember is this. That if you have to divide uh, one complex number by another, it's helpful to introduce the conjugate complex number um, in the denominator and the numerator. So you take the denominator thing you want to divide by, it's the hard thing to deal with, so we'll introduce its, its conjugate in the denominator and in the numerator, and that way it won't change the answer because we've only divided and multiplied by the same w bar, so that doesn't change the answer, but it also makes this into a real number, so it's easier to manipulate. So just remember that part, don't remember all this, but this does enable us, we can see by unwinding all this stuff, to give a, an answer completely in terms of ordinary real number expressions for what division means. So we have a perfectly rigorous definition of division. So if we wanted to do an example, again, I wouldn't use this because I'd never remember that. I only remember this bit. Let's just see if we can do a simple example of dividing uh, one of these numbers by another one. Um, so we'll just uh, work out a simple example of, uh, uh, so z is uh, 2 minus 3i and w is 1 plus, uh, let's say, 4i. And we'll try to divide one by the other. Z over W is 2 minus 3i divided by 1 plus 4i. Um, now, I have to do a conjugate of W on the numerator and denominator. So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate of this. The complex conjugate of this guy is 1, that's 1 plus 4i, so the conjugate is 1 minus 4i. And I multiply numerator and denominator by the same thing so that I don't change the answer. Um, so that gives me, if I expand this out, I get 2 times 1. Um, and then I get minus times minus, they cancel in pairs. 3 times 4 is 12. And then another minus from the i, so minus 12. And then there's going to be some i part. It's going to be, uh, the outer term here is 8 minus 8i. Eight minus 8 from the 2 times the 4 is 8. And then uh, with a minus sign here, minus 8. And then here we get minus 3. And then an i. And then we have to divide by 1 plus 4i times mi minus 4i. I simply remember the formula that it's the sum of the squares of the parts, real and imaginary parts. It doesn't matter whether you use the minuses or the pluses there because we're squaring. So now we get. Um, equals, well, 2 minus 12 is minus 10. Minus 8 minus 3 is minus 11, I hope, i. And then um, divided by, that's 1 squared plus 4 squared. So 1 squared is 1, 4 squared is 16, so that's 17. And finally, I can write it as minus 10 over 17 minus 11 over 17 times i in real and imaginary parts. So it's not very difficult to do. So there are a lot of laws of arithmetic that, that we're used to, and they also hold for complex numbers. Um, that, for example, zw is wz, um, and z plus w is w plus z for any z w. doesn't matter what order you multiply or add in. Of course, that's not true for, this isn't true, for instance, for matrices. So it is, an, it is an important observation that it is true for complex numbers. We don't have to check it, but you could, if you wanted, expand it all out and see why that works. Um, you also get things like, um, if you have complex numbers, let's say z1, z2, 
and Z3, um, you could work out that if you expand it all out, because it's just sums of real parts and sums of imaginary parts, it's easy to see that it's just the same in any order. Uh, so um, we let Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 equal either of these, either of those. Um, and, and this is, of course, again, uh, something that has to be checked, because there are weird uh, sort of arithmetic systems in which this law doesn't hold, but this isn't one of them. The complex numbers have all the reasonable arithmetic properties that they inherit from the real numbers. Um, they have all those nice properties. So we'll just define when we add a bunch of complex numbers, we can do them in, in any order we like. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you parenthesize. You don't have to parenthesize sums. You have to parenthesize um, other expressions, of course. Um, so, for instance, Z1 plus Z2 times Z3. Uh, that is Z1, Z3 plus Z2, Z3. Um, for example, that's one of the non-obvious facts about complex numbers that has to be checked by explicitly expanding. We won't do it, but it's another of the basic facts of arithmetic for real numbers that turns out to hold also for complex numbers. Um, so, uh, let's see, so we've got uh, uh, the most of the rules we need. So the, the complex conjugation has also special properties. Um, they are rather um, remarkable that, um, for example, if you multiply and then conjugate, it's the same as if you conjugated and then multiplied. And in fact, it's true of all the arithmetic operations. If you add and then conjugate the same as if con you conjugate and then add. If you subtract and then conjugate the same as if you conjugate and then subtract. And also if you divide and then conjugate, it's the same as if you conjugated and then divided. So in other words, conjugation produces all the arithmetic, which is not immediately obvious. You'd have to actually check all those things to make sure that it works. Um, another uh, important observation about these kind of numbers is, uh, as we said before, that there is this uh, relationship to Pythagorean theorem. Um, if you think about um, the Pythagorean theorem, we said that if you had an, an x and a y, that it had uh, uh, sides of a triangle. This is the length of the other side. Um, now, uh, so it naturally makes, uh, it makes sense for us to define, for a given a complex number, z as x plus i, y, will define the length of the complex number to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. So it's called the length, or most often by complex analysts, it's called the modulus of uh, the complex number. Z is just this expression here. And um, it's also called the, or the uh, absolute value. It's also called the absolute uh, value because it's similar to absolute value for real numbers. It's how big a thing it is. So it gets rid of any notion of, of uh, being positive or negative for, for, for real numbers. But in, for complex numbers, it gets rid of any of the, of the imaginary nonsense and gives us a, a size of how big the number is. And of course, we already know that we saw this x squared plus y squared before. We saw that, in fact, we uh, already saw that z, z bar is x squared plus y squared. And so that gives us, in this context, that the length of a, or modulus, or absolute value of a complex number is the square root of z, z bar, or, uh, as it's often used, the length squared is exactly z, z bar, um, which is not all that obvious fact about complex numbers, that how big a complex number is, uh, squared, is computed by multiplying by its conjugate. But we've seen that it's true. Now, conjugation, as it fits with all the all the arithmetic laws, um, it also uh, fits neatly with this length thing, in that the length of the conjugate is the length of the original complex number, which you can check. Um, again, there's lots and lots and lots of things to check, but they're all very easy. Just plug in real imaginary parts and expand everything out, because this guy, uh, it's easy to do this one by saying, well, this guy is the square root of x squared plus negative y squared. And this one, on the other hand, um, is uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared. And are those equal? Yes, because the minus signs cancel in pairs again. So it's very easy to see that that matches up with that. And so those are the same. Um, for example, so that te te tests that one, and there's lots of other ones. Another uh, startling result about, about the complex conjugation is that, uh, is that the length of um, 
uh, of the product of two complex numbers is the product of the lengths. And that's really not obvious why that would be true. That requires you really to expand everything out and check. Um, so it, uh, that, that's one of the more mysterious ones uh, that, we've, that we've listed here. And also the same thing then works by replacing a complex number by its reciprocal. You can see that, um, that not only is this conjugation preserved these arithmetic operations, but actually this absolute value also does have this has nice arithmetic properties. Again, these are all things you should check by just expanding everything out and seeing what happens. So I don't want to, I don't want to do everything. Um, there's better for you to try and do it yourself. They're fairly simple. Um, and finally, one thing we can calculate out is so we can find the real part of a complex number um, is the average of the of its uh, of the complex number and its conjugate, which is a useful result we use quite often um, to find uh, the real part. Uh, to relate real parts to conjugations, because conjugations have nicer uh, arithmetic. The real part operation has terrible arithmetic, but conjugation has very nice arithmetic, so it's better to work with it if you can. And the imaginary part is a much more complicated expression, which I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, waste too much time on. But it's a similar sort of thing. It looks like that. The imaginary part is not quite an average, but an average over uh, dividing by i, and not really an average, but of a difference between the number and its conjugate. It's a bit more complicated. But this one is the one we'd use more often, um, relating the real part, which is often the thing we want to actually calculate, to um, to the to the value in the conjugate. And again, the conjugate has nice arithmetic, but real part is often uh, of some of some significance in a in a in a uh, physical problem. So summing up, we've said more or less that all the standard rules of arithmetic that we're used to uh, still hold, but that also there are additional rules. Um, the, the rules of absolute values hold the same just as they did for real numbers. Uh, things like absolute value of the ratio is the ratio of the absolute values. Um, and, but there's also this, this conjugation, and it flips all the all the arithmetic laws to themselves. It per perfectly preserves all of arithmetic. Addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, and division are all conjugated to themselves. So um, so it, it's surprising that it has that kind of magic property. And that's fairly easy to remember. Uh, this sort of thing's maybe a little bit hard to remember. This one's almost impossible to remember, which we won't, won't worry about, won't need to remember it. Conceptually, the way we've introduced complex numbers really fits exactly how they, were, how they arose historically. Um, they did come up by playing around, pretending that there's a that there's a quantity called i, um, so that i squared is minus one. Why did that happen? It happened because um, historically in the Renaissance, uh, Cardano was trying to find um, solutions to polynomial equations, and he found an explicit formula for the for the cubic equation, which generalizes our our, our old friend the quadratic, uh, b squared minus four ac. Uh, this thing. Uh, uh, this is our famous quadratic equation, finding the roots of the quadratic. He found a formula for the roots of the cubic, and ultimately um, found one. Also, I think I think it's also him found for the quartic. Um, but the problem is that instead of these simple operations here, it involved some additional compl complications. The, com the formula for the cubic is much more complicated, and in the process of trying to find solutions for real uh, cubic equations with real number coefficients. Uh, in with which happen to have real roots. So starting with a real variable problem and ending up with a real variable solution, in the middle of the calculation, you're forced to use complex numbers. You're supposed to, you're forced to end up with quantities like this. Um, and uh, so Cardano just ignored that. Um, he did it. He, he wrote down the formula. He knew how to do the, how to use it to find the answers. And he just ignored the fact in the middle of the calculations, meaningless quantities were coming up that involved this kind of an I type of thing. Um, uh, so, so, but however, it did give rise to um, a rather important result. As I say, he cut the solution to the to the to the um, qu cubic and the, and the quartic, but also it gave rise eventually to the filing observation, which was took a great deal of time to prove, but uh, but it was more or less understood to be true um, once people started playing with with these complex numbers that there was this fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, which is that every um, every non-constant uh, polynomial of one variable, one uh, real or complex variable, 
with real or complex um, coefficients. Um, Uh, factors into linear factors uh, over the complex numbers. In other words, complex coefficient factors. So you can factor anything. Um, so if we consider uh, as an example, I mean, we're not going to actually prove this theorem, but if you consider as an example our x squared plus 1, which we said originally didn't have any roots, um, it didn't have any real number roots. It now has i and minus i as real number roots, and in fact it factors. It's x minus i times x plus i. But you have to allow complex numbers. Even though it's a real variable problem, the solution involves complex numbers. So uh, so this is a reason why we'd more or less have to, if we want to work with, with functions as simple as polynomials in one variable, we have to allow complex numbers. There's really no escaping them. They're extremely practical. They're so practical that they work their way into mathematics in the work of Cardano, even before anyone knew what they meant. They had no kind of justification for working with these things. Um, they were a kind of embarrassment. Uh, why, why were they showing up? What were they? But eventually, they made uh, a, a, they, a, a case for themselves because we have to use them. Um, and then we're, once we allow ourselves to, to use them, all of a sudden we can do much more powerful things. A lot of problems have, have uh, really nice solutions in, in that setting in, of complex numbers. So they're really practical objects that are essential to the, even the simplest mathematical equations.